and me for uh, hosting us this evening. My name is Christy Edwards. I'm the co-chair of the International Organizations Interest Group. And in my day job, I also work for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, or the OSCE. So it's a real Join us for this discussion on uh, the role of armed, uh, the role of international organizations in armed conflict, um, as it is a personal in topic of interest of mine. Um, but it's also an opportunity to bring together three of the women I most admire um, in this space to have this conversation today. So I'm going to do a brief uh, overview of their bio so you can get to know them a little bit. And um, then we're going to have more of a, a moderated discussion amongst uh, the four of us um, for about 45 minutes or so. And then I'm going to open it up for questions. So there is a Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to type in any questions. And I can also feed those to the panelists as we go along and don't feel shy to, to ask um, anything that you might be thinking about as we go along. So uh, I'll start by introducing Cordula. Cordula Drog is the Chief Legal Officer and Head of the Legal Division of the ICRC, where she leads the ICRC's efforts to uphold, implement, and develop international humanitarian law. She joined the ICRC in 2005 and has held a number of positions in the field and at headquarters, including as the Head of the Legal Advisors to Operations, and most recently as Chief of Staff to the President of the ICRC. She has some 20 years of experience in the field of international law and in her earlier career worked for the International Commission of Jurists, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and the Max Planck Institute for International Law. She holds a law degree and a PhD from the University of Heidelberg and an LLM from the London School of Economics. Next, we have Mona Rishmawi, who is a human rights lawyer currently serving as the Chief of the Rule of Law, Equality and Non-Discrimination Branch of the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, or OHCHR. And her legal expertise relates to human rights and armed conflict, transitional justice and accountability, detention, women's human rights, and the protection of minorities. She started her legal and human rights career as a practicing lawyer and worked And organizations. And she also served as the UN Independent Expert on Human Rights in Somalia from 1996 to 2000, and as the Executive Director of the UN International Commission of Inquiry on Darfur in 2004 and 2005, resulting in the first referral of a situation by the Security Council to the ICC. And her current responsibilities include leading OHCHR's works, work on rule of law, women's rights and gender issues, racial justice, minorities, and indigenous peoples. And finally, last but not least, Maria Daniela Maruda is the chair of the European Committee Against Racism and Intolerance since January of 2020 and is an independent member from Greece. She's an assistant professor in international law at the Pantheon University of Athens and the Jean, Jean Monnet chairholder in civil protection and humanitarian action with an emphasis on migration and solidarity. She's also the director of the European Training and Research Center on Human Rights and Humanitarian Action and the head of EU and UNHCR research projects on mapping integration indi indicators for the inclusion of refugee and migrant children through education, as well as on homelessness of unaccompanied children. Maria has 15 years of experience in humanitarian fieldwork through the OSCE, UNHCR, and the ICRC in armed conflicts such as Bosnia and Herzegovina, Albania, Kosovo, and Sri Lanka and then onwards based in Greece with short missions and crisis areas. And I also know Maria quite well from uh, her service on the Jean Pictet IHL committee, um, which is another wonderful thing. If you're a law student interested in IHL, um, please do look that up. It's a wonderful, wonderful way to learn more about IHL and have an absolute blast doing so. But um, to get our conversation started today, I'll first um, ask Cordula uh, to start us off with um, an overview of the ICRC's role as the guardian of the Geneva Conventions and how their work in developing the law of armed, armed conflict applies. Thank you very much, Christy. And of course, the compliment goes right back to you. And thanks for inviting us um, on this panel. It's a real pleasure also to be here with uh, Maria Daniela and, and Mona. 
Um, so I'm going to have to, I thought I need to probably bore you for a couple of minutes with mandate issues and, you know, things like this. So the ICRC derives its mandates from the Geneva Conventions, which it invented to start with, and the statutes of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. So the, the other thing that I want to say before I go into the mandate on IHL is to say it is embedded in a broader mandate of the ICRC in Common Article 3 to the Geneva Conventions, Common Article 9 to the Geneva Conventions on its humanitarian activities. So Common Article 9 and other articles talk about the humanitarian activities of the ICRC explicitly, but also other organizations um, for the protections of civilian persons, uh, wounded and sick, prisoners of war, and for their relief. And so what I do want to emphasize that the, the legal work of the ICRC is always also humanitarian work and is um, its objective is a humanitarian objective. Now, more concretely, the statutes of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement give the IC set out a bit more explicitly the mandate on IHL and the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement is composed of the ICRC, of national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies and the federation of these societies. And at the international conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, these components come together with states. And this is where the mandate of the ICRC and the statutes was, was adopted. So it is a mandate that's also given by the ICRC by states. And it includes, and there I quote, to undertake the tasks upon, incumbent upon it under the Geneva Conventions to work for the faithful application of IHL and take cognizance of complaints. And it is also to work for the understanding and dissemination of knowledge of IHL applicable in armed conflict and to prepare any development thereof. And so derived from this, I will say the work of the ICRC on in armed conflicts and to improve respect for IHL and so protection of civilians and others um, in armed conflict is multifaceted. It starts with the everyday application of international humanitarian law in the ICRC's operations. So it starts with a dialogue with belligerents, mostly a confidential and bilateral dialogue with belligerents states and non-state armed groups about how they apply IHL and how they can be better at applying IHL um, in the messy reality of conflicts. And what I like about this, I have to say, is that it informs then also and is a real test for our interpretations of IHL because they have to be tested against what our lawyers in the field will then discuss, you know, in South Sudan, in the DRC, in Sri Lanka with, with the belligerents. And then um, we have, and this is also derived um, from a mandate by states, what we call the advisory services in the ICRC, and it is basically our capacity building mandate. And that derives from a resolution, again, of the International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent of 1995, so it's about 20 years old now, or 25 years old, um, in which states asked the ICRC to work for the universal ratification of IHL conventions and also for better dissemination and understanding. And so the, IC, I, the advisory services of the ICRC are really there to help states ratify international IHL treaties, but also then to implement them into their legislations, into their uh, military manuals, into their you know, everyday practice, their policies, for instance, also um, implementing uh, criminalization of, um, of war crimes and other crimes, of course, into their national legislation. And then thirdly, the work for the clarification and possible development of international humanitarian law. Um, and on that, I'll just mention uh, a, a couple of things that some of you might be familiar with. So the ICSC sees it as its role also to really work for the clarification of international humanitarian law and also for making it a live instrument and uh, a living instrument for contemporary armed conflict because of course some of the conventions are quite old 
And I'll just mention here the customary law study of 2005, which was commissioned by states, where states asked the ICRC to clarify what the customary rules of IHL are. This came from the fact, of course, that at the time, there was no universal ratification of the conventions nor of the additional protocols. In the meantime, and I think that's a great success, there is universal ratification of the Geneva Conventions. They're the only universally ratified conventions, not of the additional protocols, so we're still working on that. Um, and another project on clarification is that we're updating the, the commentaries to the four Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols, which date from the 50s and 70s, um, and, and where we think we need to take into account the evolution of conflicts, the evolution of state practice, um, the evolution also of international criminal law practice, for instance, of international tribunals, but also really um, take into account much more of a contemporary understanding, for instance, of the role of women in armed conflicts, which in the Geneva Conventions is still based on quite a traditional and rather outdated uh, role for women in armed conflict, or also a more modern understanding of persons with disabilities, understanding that this is not just a health issue, but a social issue, and so on. And then, of course, the development of IHL, and, and it, I sort of loop back to what I said uh, at the beginning, the ICRC invented uh, IHL in a way and proposed the first Geneva Convention in 1864, and has since then always prepared drafts and, and um, proposals for states to then negotiate uh, the convention. So the ICRC has very much a um, um, a proposal role, which then, of course, is for states to negotiate. So treaties are, of course, negotiated amongst states. And perhaps one of the ones that people are less aware of or, or is less on people's radar is the fact that the ICRC was also um, a great instigator of the Convention on Conventional Weapons. So in the 70s, the ICRC, you know, um, really also led and played a strong role in the development and promotion of this treaty um, and, and convened a group of experts to lay the foundational framework for this. And since then, over the years, we've worked very hard to really um, bring these IHL treaties that concern weapons also um, into the, into the, on, on the political agenda of states blinding laser weapons, um, the protocol on explosive remnants of war, etc. Really understanding that weapons issues shouldn't just be questions of disarmament, but are also humanitarian issues and have, um, you know, weapons have a, 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 a great effect of, on people on the ground. And this work for us is always um, or almost always, I would say, um, informed by what we see on the ground. And, and the, perhaps the most speaking um, example of that is the, is the anti-personnel mine ban convention, which, you know, caused the, such great suffering that the ICRC, together with many others, um, uh, you know, carried a campaign to, to, ban, uh, to ban those weapons. Um, it's perhaps in the area of weapons that we now see the greatest need for development of the law today because of, um, you know, because of the fourth industrial, the, 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 rev the digital revolution, basically, the digitalization of conflicts, the fact that cyber operations become a mainstream in, in armed conflicts, uh, the development of autonomous weapon systems. So this is a work that I think will always be ongoing for us, informed again, um, by the humanitarian needs. Thank you, Christy, and back over to you. Thank you. And I think it's so important that we understand the development of IHL as, it, it's, as it's so inextricably linked to the ICRC as an institution. Um, so thank you. And, and I, my next question, you know, because we often talk about uh, state responsibility, of course, in upholding treaties, but within armed conflict, as everyone knows, um, there are quite a number of non-state armed groups involved in armed conflict. And so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the ICRC's work and engagement with non-state armed groups. Yeah, so I, again, at the outset, I, I, I really want to stress this is always the humanitarian objective. And so the reason why the ICRC engages with non-state armed groups is first and foremost because we engage with any party to the conflict that has control over a population or that has an effect on the well-being and, uh, and unfortunately, on the suffering of populations. 
um, and non-state armed groups are part of those uh, belligerents. So it's a very pragmatic reason to um, engage with them. And I'm saying this also because, of course, it's a very it's a it's a very politicized area, um, very much um, where our work very much is carried out in a much broader framework of a counterterrorism narrative by states, sanctions by states, um, sometimes a criminalization of engagement with non-state armed groups. Um, and so we, we are constantly having to remind uh, states of, of the humanitarian objective that if humanitarians, the ICSC and others, cannot speak to non-state armed groups, cannot reach the populations under the control of armed groups, ultimately it's the populations that suffer. Um, we estimate that today we have about 100 armed conflicts and we have about 100 non-state armed groups that are parties to conflict, more or less. But there are, of course, many more non-state armed groups and our colleagues who, who you know, deal with, with the, the, the sociological phenomenon of non-state armed groups estimate they, that um, we, we have about, um, about uh, 400 with which we engage in our operations. Now, not all of those are parties to conflict. In fact, the majority aren't. But I do want to mention it because you, you, did, you did ask about... Um, about non-state armed groups. And I think it's important to, to put that into this broader framework. And we estimate that about 150 million people live either under the control of armed groups or in, in areas contested between uh, belligerents, including armed groups. And so the way we engage with them is really through a neutral um, way, so not taking sides uh, between parties to conflicts. And also, I would say, pref preferably, and we do the same with states, in confidential bilateral dialogue. Now, in terms of IHL, I, I thought maybe one of the things I could do is just illustrate this with a recent COVID, with some recent example of engagement in the in the context of the of the COVID pandemic. Um, so as I said before, and as you can imagine, these groups range from, you know, uh, gangs in the favelas of, of Rio or, or other cities to, you know, quasi-state authorities that govern millions of people, such as, you know, in, in eastern Ukraine uh, and, and other places. And so the difference here greatly affects also how these groups deal with the pandemic. But what we have seen is that some groups take very similar measures to state responses to the pandemic, in fact. So they impose curfews, they order, um, you know, the closure of, of shops and government institutions, they permit only essential businesses, uh, and so on. So in northeast Syria, this was the case, in Myanmar, this was the case. And on the other hand, we also have some groups that take much more problematic responses. And we have seen, again, not only by non-state armed groups, but we're talking here about non-state armed groups. For instance, in Colombia, certain armed groups that really took, uh, you know, COVID-19 measures in areas which they operate to, and, and basically enforced the rules that they'd imposed very brutally, including by, um, by shooting persons who wouldn't respect the curfew. And so, you know, there's also engagement here. And so operationally, we pass a whole range of, of messages to such groups. Um, and in some, in, in many contexts, it's rather simple. So it's about, you know, respect for the prohibition of ill treatment, uh, not killing people, etc. cetera. Um, Philippines would, would be an example where, where we did this, but in some cases, um, and especially where groups govern territories de facto, it becomes a bit more complicated in terms of, um, you know, IHL, because um, one of the main issues, of course, that happened in COVID-19 was restrictions of movement, and IHL isn't really isn't really a body of law that deals with restrictions of movement. It's much more a human rights question, and so legally, uh, you know, that might pose some questions. But I would say still that, for instance, in places like Yemen you can still have this dialogue on a, on a very pragmatic basis. And going forward, of course, the key issue for us will be vaccinations, well, not just for us, but for others. And given that we're present in, in many of these places, we, we are also 
offering the possibility, you know, uh, to to act as a neutral intermediary, for instance, uh, to facilitate dialogue between parties to armed conflicts, to to safe access, to actually have the possibility to vaccinate, uh, to work with authorities or national societies to to offer vaccinations, and and what we some, sometimes call re going the last mile, because of course in some areas there aren't many humanitarian actors present, and sometimes the ICRC is is the only one. Sometimes Sometimes another humanitarian actor might be the only one. But we also uh, have seen, of course, a great vaccination hesitancy and, and, um, and skepticism. And for instance, in some contexts, you know, the fact that the counter Bin Laden operation was in part disguised as a vaccination campaign in Pakistan is not forgotten in the minds of people. And so there are there are still some uh, some issues also to overcome of, of, of mistrust and so so on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd not let, next like to turn things over to Mona and wondered Mona if you could give us an overview of the OHCHR's role in advancing human rights protections in the context of armed conflict. Well, thank you very very much, and thank you also. Uh, to ISIL for to ASIL for this uh, very important panel and for uh, inviting me with Kurdula and uh, and uh, Rosemary. So maybe just to say a few words about uh, OHCHR or the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights because you might be your audience might be uh, aware of or not. We are of course a United Nations entity, and since its establishment. Uh, maybe in 1947 or something like that, the, uh, the UN has always had a structure that actually dealt with human rights. Uh, a lot of that, uh, that structure was basically very much devoted in the 40s, 50s, 60s to establishing to the normative part, to basically working on the development of human rights law. But if you look carefully at the work of the United Nations at that time, already from the 50s and 60s, you will find that all the time human rights law has been developed almost always against, a, against a, the experience of conflict. So there was always this situation of where does human rights law fit in, conflict, in a conflict setting. Then you get in 1994, you get the Balkan Wars. Uh, uh, and at that time, the human rights work was very much an intergovernmental work, a discussion at the, at the intergovernmental level in the General Assembly, at the time in the Human Rights Council. And people were extremely frustrated. And I, I was there representing the organization that Connexus, Cordula, and I, many, many connections, but including our background in the International Commission of Jurists. I was there in Vienna when the World Conference of Human Rights uh, uh, took place. And the biggest frustration at the time is that there was no voice expressing the voice of victims. And there was a lot of reporting from journalists and so on. But the authoritative voice to tell the international community what was going on in the former Yugoslavia was lacking. So in 1994, uh, the uh, World Conference of Human Rights established the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights with that background in mind. This is the voice of victims. This is the person who is of high, uh, uh, high personal standing and quality and so on to give voice to victims and to make the victims visible in the, in the work of, uh, of humans. So against that background, there is now an Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights that works in, in both peace times and in conflict zones. For example, only recently, we are of course like everyone else, we're in Afghanistan and unfortunately we have to evacuate like everybody else. So, uh, uh, and now uh, we have colleagues working back in Afghanistan with now the humanitarian actors coming back. So at this stage, this office, which was created in 94, has 1,300 1, staff from 121 countries. So we have really a, a big diversity of, uh, of staff uh, 
and we have presence in 90, uh, 92 countries. So our specific contribution uh, to this, and I would like to maybe also give you the chance to ask me a few uh, uh, follow up questions. So I will say at this stage, working advancing human rights of, in conflict is one of our key strategic uh, objectives. We do that in three distinct ways. Advancing normative clarity is for us is really important, and we do that through working, uh, taking uh, the dictum and the judgments and the pronouncements of the International uh, Court of Justice and a bit of law there since the nuclear weapon advisory opinion, working through uh, the wall advisory opini uh, opinion, the, uh, the uh, DRC versus uh, Uganda and the various court, various judgments that to told us that human rights continue to apply in armed um, conflict and the, protect the protection of human rights is indispensable. Actually, if you look at the actual decisions of the International Court of Justice judgments and, uh, uh, and uh, opinions, you'll find that they use human rights material, particularly the monitoring and reporting of the Office of the High Commissioner for human rights to establish facts and to tell us what is going on in a particular situation. So three, three distinct, uh, three distinct, I think, uh, 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 objectives: advancing normative clarity, enhancing trans uh, transparency uh, around what is happening in the conflict, who's doing what, and telling the international community who's doing what. And the third is, uh, is accountability. So let me just say a few words about uh, normative clarity and then I'll, uh, maybe I'll pause because I don't want to speak too long and I want you to be able to ask me follow up questions. So on the normative clarity, which I think is really uh, important, I think Cordula was very right to stress that the Geneva Conventions now are universally ratified. Uh, the protocols are less ratified, but really very, very particular protocol one and two, you know, they have uh, about 170 ratifications each. So it's really very, very accepted uh, norm, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Geneva Conventions and their add additional protocols. In the case of human rights, actually is, is, is almost, uh, as, as important because today 99% of the world populations are governed by states that had, have ratified more than five core human rights treaties. So as you know, we have the two major covenants, but we also have the sectorial treaties dealing with women, with children, with specific issues such as torture, disappearances, um, uh, disability, um, and, and so on. So we have the covenant on civil and political rights, the covenant in economic, social and cultural rights, and in between these sectorial treaties. So we, in our, in our judgment, in our calculation, 99% of the world are governed by states that have ratified these treaties. If you look at the normative uh, aspect of how human rights normatively uh, enhance uh, human rights protection in conflict, you will find, again, three distinct ways. One is the applicability. And there, I don't want to speak a lot more about it. But if you look at how our own uh, expert bodies that look at the monitoring and ratification um, the monitoring and implementation, sorry, not ratification, uh, monitoring and implementation of the treaties that I mentioned, you'll find that what they have been doing is looking at, because what they have to do is to examine states' reports. They have to examine what the state is doing. So the state, the state could be in a situation of peace, but it also could be in a situation of conflict. So through their thematic work and through their observations that they have done over the time, what they actually realize, and with the help of the International, Commission, uh, International Court of Justice, the ICJ, what they actually realize is that human rights treaties not only apply, but also do something very specific in the context of conflict. So the application is important, 
the extraterritorial application, which has been, uh, which the, these treaty bodies have been really stressing, has been extremely important. Because what they realized is that states were saying, okay, we are fine with the norms around where we are within our territory. The moment we go outside our territory, different norms are apply. So this gray zone of what are these norms and what happens in that situation becomes extremely difficult for human rights implementations and frankly also for IHL, extremely difficult for both. So what norms apply when becomes extremely important. So what human rights bodies have been saying is that you take, you take human rights law with you wherever you have and the test there is effective control. And I can elaborate on that in the questions. The second thing that they did is that they showed us in a very practical and pragmatic way how reading the two laws together actually can advance protection. So if you read IHL and human rights, you'll find that there are very specific things that could happen. Look at common article three of the Geneva Convention and here general comment 29 tells us this, the uh, common article three, look at it in terms of the state of emergency and what happens in the derogation. And you'll get that, you know, presumption of innocence is always there. You know, that, that uh, look at, for example, what happens in that uh, deprivation of liberty and what the committees are telling us, secret detentions, irrespective of whether this is in a in a conflict or in a peace situation is actually not acceptable and they use ihl to tell us that to tell us that that's really important and the most and importantly they give a lot of gravitas to their uh, visits and to access by icrc to all places of detention and they say this is an additional safeguard that is important now the part that people don't realize as much is how much human rights law strengthens the protection in human in armed conflict. Take, for example, the prohibition of torture. It's mentioned in so many uh, treaties. It's one line in a treaty in, in, in the Geneva Convention in the protocols. It's one. It's a uh, two few lines in the ICC statute. But we have a specific convention on torture, and that convention on torture tells us that there is no exceptional circumstances, that torture is prohibited within, in all circumstances. So that prohibition and the prevention of torture, which is really important, is extremely spelled out in the convention. It's telling us exactly what steps do you need to take. So taking that, those measures and putting them in place as, as, the, as the state uh, is, in, is, is still intact and so on, brings in prevention measures in, for certain acts, including during armed conflict. Um, it also tells us that uh, certain groups and certain, uh, certain um, I want to give an example from the economic and social uh, rights uh, uh, sphere. If you look, for example, at water, if you look at looking at water as a right and combining that of how you know you cannot destroy, destroy uh, uh, refrain from unlawful pollution of air, water, and soil, and so on, and reading that into uh, uh, into uh, IHL brings in a lot more clarity of what that norm means. Um, and lastly, you know, on that aspect, I just want to highlight that there are specific groups that uh, the that uh, the various bodies that OHCHR supports and we uh, advance their work, we advance their monitoring uh, of states report, their discussions and dialogues in the state reports and so on, that what we call the treaty bodies have been stressing certain actors such as journalists uh, uh, or co acting in, uh, in conflict zones, such as uh, um, human rights defenders, uh, trying to uh, really work around uh, around uh, around various uh, various uh, aspects. I would, uh, if you allow me, and I don't know if you would like to have a follow up question, but I would want to also elaborate a bit on the transparency and the accountability. But I give it to you to see if you would like to pose a particular question, uh, uh, Christy, or I should go on. Yeah. 
Um, I, I definitely have several follow-up questions. Maybe I'll first go to um, to Maria just to make sure we have enough time to um, let her chat. But then I've got quite a few follow-up questions and we've got a question from the audience as well um, that we can come back to. Um, so Maria, perhaps um, if you could talk a little bit about ECRI's country monitoring and recommendations, uh, particularly in conflict affected countries. Um, and specifically, if you have any uh, suggestions on how to address the, the monitoring in gray areas or uh, disputed territories, that would be fantastic if you could uh, address that. Thank you very much, uh, Christy, and thank, uh, thanks for the invitation, Azil as well, and for this extremely uh, interesting uh, panel discussion. Um, have been, having been, and I'm still uh, an expert, let's say, on IHL, working on a human rights monitoring body uh, on racism and intolerance has been a challenge, especially in, in areas of conflict, or as we call it in the Council of Europe, uh, gray zones or disputed territories. Uh, because this is an issue of concern to us, how to have access to these uh, uh, territories for monitoring purposes so as not to leave gaps in the protection of human rights. So, so this is an issue of concern to ECRI um, as a, a Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, but also to other uh, monitoring bodies, uh, the Commissioner on Human Rights uh, of, the, of the Council of Europe, uh, the Parliamentary Assembly, the Committee of Ministers, who is the political organ of the organization of 47 member states. And I would like to initially say that um, Mona reminded us of, of a very important uh, date, which was the Vienna Convention, uh, the, the Vienna Summit in 1993, and it was exactly then that the Committee of Ministers decided to establish ECRI uh, so as to address uh, issues of racism and intolerance that was surged at the time um, was on the surge in Europe. And uh, we have seen after 27 years of monitoring uh, that uh, we are uh, facing again another very worrying trend in Europe when it comes to lack of social cohesion, threats, conflicts, quite heated conflicts, uh, highly sensitive politicized uh, uh, issues uh, in the Council of Europe. And um, I would uh, briefly like to discuss uh, two or three issues on how as ECRI we um, have dealt with this. So what um, uh, the Council of Europe is known as a standard setting mechanism, as we call it. So we have more than 220 more or less conventions. And then in this triangle, we have another area where we monitor how states perform uh, with these standards. And then we have um, a third element of cooperation. So Council of Europe helps, and also um, together with OSCE in that respect, and ODIR, helps a member state to implement our recommendations as monitoring bodies. Uh, and all this is quite an effective, let's say, mechanism when it comes to both prevention of conflicts, of tensions, but also on addressing specific uh, and helping out assistance states to implement these recommendations. So this is an important point. We are now on our sixth cycle of monitoring. Uh, each cycle lasts for about five years, which means that every five years we monitor all 47 member states. And are on the sixth cycle, just to give you an idea of the, of the issues we focus on, uh, we um, uh, monitor um, what we call independent and effective equality bodies. So uh, the bodies that are actually uh, there to assist nationally uh, all victims of racism and intolerance. Um, inclusive education. So we really look up at what is happening in schools in and around or through education, because this is where you can really uh, see uh, ten tensions rising hate speech or even violence, which is the next uh, issue we focus in, uh, on our reports. Uh, so we see hate speech online more and more and among political, let's say, or even religious or other public figures and addressing and, and uh, our recommendations really um, uh, are addressed to governments 
uh, or to parliamentary bodies and uh, other bodies on how to combat, especially or counter hate speech online. And uh, we also focus on uh, what we call integration slash inclusion. So how to build inclusive societies. Uh, so you see, these are all areas where you can identify risk factors or where you see issues that might produce what we call vicious circles of uh, uh, hatred uh, um, uh, depicting specific groups as enemies uh, within society, minorities, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, two years ago, when we were celebrating our 25th anniversary, uh, we adopted a roadmap and there, uh, we said we would revise after 20 years our general policy recommendation. So what ECRI is doing is one, country reports and monitoring, two, general policy recommendations addressed to states uh, based on experience from our monitoring. And uh, we have adopted, we had adopted 20 years ago, um, a general policy recommendation on uh, combating antisemitism and anti-Muslim hatred. And we decided that after 20 years, we needed to look back into these um, recommendations and update them. We have adopted, uh, and we will soon publish the one on antisemitism, which is actually touching upon what is happening in the Middle East somehow. And this is highly politicized. It was uh, an issue that created debates uh, within ECRI. And um, I'm really looking forward when this document comes up uh, on, on how this uh, will be uh, seen also uh, among different associations that have helped us a lot uh, in this update, this revision. The second, uh, we hope to adopt it by the end of the year, is on anti-Muslim racism, as we call it. So... Uh, religious groups uh, and um, how states, when they are actually um, dealing with, uh, for example, anti-terrorism or countering terrorism uh, operations, activities, uh, um, et cetera, et cetera, a specific group, Muslims, is being targeted directly or indirectly is another issue that we see comes up more and more in these um, uh, discussions and in, um, in creating tendencies. Uh, so our recommendations also deal with this um, deep-rooted, as we call it, racism, structured racism, institutional police profiling, um, how um, uh, this culture, uh, how we can build this new culture within the police and uh, how we can assist. And again, this is another area where we work together with OSCE ODIR on trainings with the police and on um, uh, seeing uh, real change. So um, this would be more or less uh, how we see um, ECRI's role. And then last year, we did something we don't do very often. It's rather an extraordinary measure. We actually had to make a public statement on gray zones and disputed uh, territories, especially after Nagorno-Karabakh and this um, highly intensive intensity conflict, where um, we felt duty bound to um, discuss how racist hate speech and violence in relation to confrontations and unresolved conflicts in Europe, as we call it, um, really bring about um, a clear message that failure of governments to break the vicious circle of adversarial narratives, hate speech and violence in and around these zones may bring us back to the darkest hours of European history. Now, what is interesting is that the Committee of Ministers in late May 2021 took out um, uh, this statement and encouraged member states to take action in the light of this statement. So we have seen now more and more uh, that uh, the Council of Europe has as an utmost priority uh, 
uh, to break uh, free uh, of the cycle of the past and present hatred, to seek a better and peaceful future in inclusive societies. And this is the basic message we want to convey. Another Committee of Ministers resolution was a decision on Crimea recently. And this uh, was um, a resolution that uh, invited the Secretary General to report once a year on the human rights situation in Crimea, and even went on to invite the relevant Council of Europe human rights body, so ECRI as well, including the Commissioner for Human Rights, to consider assessing on a regular basis the human rights situation in Crimea and in other relevant areas. So this is something we really look up to. Of course, there is a cautious wording there because the Council of Europe is an intergovernmental organization. Uh, we have a very specific mandate as human rights monitoring bodies. We are state-centered, which means our reports are addressed to states and not to non-state actors. And this would mean uh, that we would need um, a number, let's say, of uh, um, guarantees, not just um, security guarantees because you need to have access. For example, I was a reporter in um, Ukraine and uh, we asked for access to Crimea and uh, Ukraine gave us access and Russia denied and said, you are welcome to do the monitoring when um, you do the monitoring on Russia, the monitoring of Crimea. So can you really, is it realistic? Uh, to, to be able to monitor the situation of minorities, of the Roma in Europe, of migrants, inclusion, um, hate speech and violence, and not discuss sovereignty issues? How can you uh, avoid providing um, legitimization when you discuss with non-state actors? And of course, member states have to consent to whatever we are doing. So we are an independent body with a very specific mandate, and the same is true for other monitoring bodies of the Council of Europe. And to negotiate access, to address recommendations, we really need to find new ways. So um, the proposal I, um, I, I wanted to make was to uh, possibly see whether in peace treaties or ceasefire treaties, you could have a clause on monitoring human rights uh, in this specific um, negotiation. So this would be an idea to bring in, uh, to differentiate between the political solution, because it's not up to the European Court for Human Rights or to ECRI to provide solutions politically on these areas. But once you have a ceasefire or a peace treaty or an agreement, then you could have clauses and monitoring in these areas. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. And I think it's it's very clear that um, between the three of you, one of the, the key themes that keeps coming out is this interplay between human rights and IHL and, and how the two bodies of law truly strengthen each other. I know that's going to be a, a key um, issue also coming out in the updated um, fourth uh, commentary um, in the next couple of years. So um, we're all looking forward to that coming out uh, soon. I have a couple of follow-up questions. We've, we've got some questions from the audience as well. So maybe what I will do is I'll bundle them together. And then in the remaining time we have left, we've got about 10 minutes here. Um, if you can maybe address everything that's been addressed to you individually and um, hopefully we'll have time to, to get to everyone. So um, Mona, my maybe follow-up question um, to take up your point about accountability mechanisms, um, love to hear a little bit more about OHCHR's judicial and non-judicial accountability mechanisms or any specific examples where you've seen effective results. Um, and then we have a comment or a question from Gerald. Um, how do we get Mona's message to teachers of public international law? Um, many students still argue in moot court uh, that, IHL, that either IHL or human rights applies, but not both. Um, and then to, um, to Maria, um, if you have time to, to give us a little bit um, uh, more information on how EFRI's work um, in monitoring identifies risk factors for armed conflict for countries that are maybe in this gray zone or, or you know, coming to the point, as we saw in Nagorno-Karabakh last year, before it uh, became the outbreak of armed conflict. Um, and then finally to, to Corey, 
or on the IHL protections for civilians in terms of cyber warfare, um, if anything is settled or if the field is progressing on this issue. So maybe we'll start in reverse order. Um, Maria, maybe we'll start with you. And maybe, I think everybody's got about three minutes um, before we, we wrap up. So um, one, one way uh, we, being a, pre a preventive, largely a preventive monitoring body um, and being there um, in each member state of the Council of Europe once every five years, identifying risk factors is difficult only through country monitoring. But uh, what we have seen is indeed whenever we had a conflict arising, you could see the areas uh, that were pinpointed in reports uh, of ECRI or of other human rights monitoring bodies like the advisory body on national minorities, etc. a few years back. So um, you do have uh, the possibility during a country monitoring to identify risk factors uh, in two ways. One is to make sure that you visit not just the capital of a of a, um, of a city, uh, of a of a state, of a member state, but areas uh, that uh, you receive information from national counterparts, NGOs, our equality bodies, um, local authorities, uh, specific regions where you do have. Uh, uh, needs uh, um, that uh, create this type of tension. So field visits have to be uh, real, have to last long. And in this COVID era, this is a huge challenge. We have tried to do remote monitoring, let's say, for example, through refugees arriving in, a, in an area from a different uh, disputed territory. But there you have issues. Where do you address your concerns on violations, for example? Because you write a report on a specific state and you get information for the conduct of another state. So that's why I said uh, you do have this possibility, but it's not up to the monitoring bodies to actually identify alone risk factors. We do have the reports we publish, and we also have the annual reports where we always address tendencies, where we see areas or issues of concern, populism arising, the far right, extremism, ultranationalistic hate speech. Um, so these are um, another possibility. This is another possibility that we have through our annual reports. And these annual reports are being discussed by the Committee of Ministers. And again, they have the opportunity to uh, provide this information and address specific um, recommendations to specific member states. As I told you earlier, um, uh, both the Secretary General and the Committee of Ministers considers um, the Commissioner on Human Rights much more relevant to do this um, um, approach uh, and to immediately visit a member state uh, where there is a concern and not uh, just a monitoring body. Uh, so the Commissioner of Human Rights has this um, opportunity uh, to um, arrive uh, in, a, in a state almost immediately and discuss issues. And that's why we have uh, synergies and cooperation um, among ourselves so that uh, we can um, um, be much more, um, we have the added value of the field uh, visit plus the annual report, and then the opportunity of having different bodies addressing issues in the Council of Europe. Now, finally, uh, I told you that in our reports, we deal more and more with education. This is another huge area uh, because you have youth activists uh, in schools, around schools, and uh, we are now turning to them more and more, especially uh, since uh, a year ago, uh, when we started more um, uh, cooperating in different youth projects, uh, but also even before that with a No Hate campaign. Um, this is another way of uh, actually finding out uh, what really matters uh, when it comes to the, the young people who are the ones that see their future at stake and are really ready to jump in uh, 
and uh, provide the solutions. So we cooperate more and more. Thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, Mona, over to you. No, thank you very much. I mean, uh, I would like to combine the questions in uh, with regard to, um, to transparency and accountability together, because for me, they go hand in hand. Our bread and butter, in addition to supporting states and uh, helping them to do the right things and putting policies and structures in place, is to monitor and report on their behavior. Let's be honest, that's what we do. And that's what we believe in. And through that process, we bring in, and I think uh, there are a number of processes that now states themselves agree to, whether through establishing special rapporteurs on thematic issues or through agreeing to a universal uh, periodic review where they look at each other's uh, policies and practices and make recommendations to each other. They are putting in place a system where their behavior becomes transparent. And for me, uh, frankly, I, after so many years in this uh, business, I really believe that this transparency is essential to bring around accountability. And without transparency and accountability, frankly, you can try to convince as much as possible. And, but you are alone. Then you are, you are yourself there with the perpetrator, with the actor. And it's really about how much convincing power you have. No, I prefer to be there backed by the international community and to be there out in the open and say what is going on. So for me, after all these years, transparency and accountability work together. More and more on accountability, two areas that I think are really, really essential in this. So we do the monitoring and the reporting and, you know, uh, unfortunately we don't have enough, a, a lot of time to talk about, a bit about the methodology and how we do that. Uh, but more and more, and you, we see these reports are, and this information is used in national legal systems as well as the international legal systems. I mentioned, uh, I mentioned the, uh, the, work, uh, the work of the International Court of Justice. And if you look carefully at the decisions of the International Court of Justice, you found that the, found, the factual basis and the, uh, of the decisions are often human rights uh, information and public human rights information. Now, you, we have the international uh, um, fact-finding missions and commissions of inquiry, and I will only mention one word, Myanmar. Without the, without the fact-finding mission on Myanmar, we would not be able, which is really uh, established by an intergovernmental body, the Human Rights Council, supported fully by our office, with staff from our office, with research from our office, from legal analysis of, uh, from our office. If that, that didn't work, we couldn't really have Myanmar with it before the International Court of Justice. And that case before the International Court of Justice and accountability mechanisms becomes important. Last word on this, uh, the same I would say on the Commission of Inquiry on Syria. Just look at the figures. They mentioned 60 cases by, that they themselves cooperated with in, in judicial, on actual judicial processes to bring in, in individuals to court. And I think that's extremely important. Last but not least, of course, this is happening outside and uh, not within the country. Within the country, within the country, we really promote and we are very uh, committed to promoting and working with states around transitional justice mechanisms. So whether they are prosecution, truth telling, uh, institutional reform, reparation programs, to bring in. Uh, to bring in relief to, uh, to, to victims. It's, a, it's very ironic because we are the United Nations. So the United Nations is member states, but at the same time, of course, our charter starts with we the people. But uh, for us, for OHCHR, the victims are the center. So I would do whatever to make sure that the victim has more protection. And for me, uh, you, to answer that last call, uh, that, that question from the audience, and I think it's a great uh, uh, a question from the audience, is that I actually stopped doing legal theory on the interplay between human rights and IHR. 
I look more at the practice. I look more at where is where you can advance protection. And if you advance protection, to me, you can do, use any tool you want. You use human rights, you use IHL, you use international criminal law, just protect these people, these victims of war and victims of armed conflict that are really living under extremely difficult situation. And they need every single one of us. So, and I think if you have that in mind, I think, and you have it in the back of your mind, legal theory is only a tool, is only a tool. And let's not forget that. It's a tool, it's an intellectual tool that we use to make us do things in an credible way to advance a goal, which is really protection. Thank you so much. Absolutely perfect. And as uh, humanity is the fundamental principle upon which all of the Red Cross movements work is based, I'll give Cordula the last word. Thanks a lot. And, and I mean, first, I want to second what Mona said and and also say, you know, there's a, there's a lot of discussion about the relationship between IHL and human rights. And I don't want to um, dismiss the need for being legally accurate, etc. But in the broad scheme of things, we are living in a sea of violations and impunity. And the goal, I think, as Mona said, should be to, um, to find, um, you know, the legal frameworks that protect people. And in fact, I would also say the areas of discussion on, you know, where human rights and IHL might not be compatible are very, very small. They, they, are, they are often the focus of attention, but they are very, very small compared to the areas where there is absolutely no contradiction, discussion, etc., because they share the same goal, which is protection of, of the human being. Did you want me to say a word about uh, cyber? I can't hear you. Sorry, I was, had muted myself. Um, yes, uh, ASIL has graciously allowed to go, uh, let us go over, few, over a few minutes. So yeah, please go ahead. So the, the very short answer is, any new technologies of warfare are subject to the obligations of international humanitarian law. And this is acknowledged by international humanitarian law, in particular additional protocol one, which requires states with any new acquisition or development or use of weapons to test and check whether it's in compliance with international humanitarian law. And so as cyber operations are deployed in armed conflict, as military um, means of warfare, they are subject to the rules of international humanitarian law. Um, that being said, of course, there are some follow-up questions on exactly how does international humanitarian law apply to a specific new technology? So just to give you um, an example, um, the, the IHL prohibits the destruction of civilian, or well, prohibits the targeting of civilian objects. Objects traditionally are things that you can touch, are tangible things. Uh, now in cyberspace, the object of attack is often data. And so the question poses itself, is data an object, which traditionally hasn't necessarily been seen as an object. From our perspective, it seems that if we want to have a contemporary and protective reading of international humanitarian law, then we have to consider data of civilians as objects that are protected against attack by international humanitarian law. And lastly, um, there is actually still some disagreement in the international community as to the very applicability of IHL in internet in um, to cyber operations. However, very recently at a group of governmental experts um, in, in a group of governmental experts of the UN's final report, uh, states found agreement on a very carefully drafted um, compromise uh, formulation, which seems to indicate that we can try to overcome um, this, this, this hurdle, um, basically in order to make sure that civilians are protected in armed conflict, whatever the new technology. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to all three of you for being willing to stay on a few minutes longer and for all of your incredible insights and examples um, that you shared with us. Clearly we should have made this a series <laughs> because there are so many uh, subtopics that we could have spent a lot more time on. So 
Thank you so much for all of your time. We'll have to think about uh, how we could continue this conversation a bit further on some of these um, really interesting additional uh, issues that, that have come up. Thanks again to our audience for all of your great questions and for staying with us a little bit longer. We'll, keep, we'll have this uh, posted online uh, in the next couple of days. And a huge thanks, of course, to Ben, Jimmy, and our ASIL hosts for putting this uh, up for us and, and making this available. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day or evening wherever you are and we look forward to 